Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com mailbag podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Be sure and check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. You can follow them on Twitter at BlueH2O underscore climate. You can give them a call at 865-299-2290 for any of your heating and air needs. We know this time of year, air conditioning is a must. It's only going to get hotter as we move into the month of August and roll into football season here. So if you've got any kind of tune-up that needs to take place, a cleanup in your duct work, uh, if you've got a repair that needs to take place, whatever needs to be done with your system, the guys at Blue Water Climate Control can take care of it. They're going to do the right repair the right way the first time. Uh, they're not going to send you out with a salesperson who's going to try to upsell you on something. They're going to send out, send out a repairman to your place to get it right and get you back cool and comfortable during these heated summer months. So be sure to check them out at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. Brent Hubbs, along with Rob Lewis, Eric Kane joins us on the mailbag edition of the podcast this week as uh, the regular crew will be back uh, in full swing next week. But we appreciate Eric jumping in here to, uh, to jump in and answer as many questions as we can get to here in the next 30 or 35 minutes or so. And we'll start right out of the gate, Eric, with a little recruiting question here. Other than Perry Horton Nichols, what are some other recruits that could jump into class between now and September 2nd? And what are the chances, uh, Vols' chances of flipping Cody Jones and Andre Stewart? Let's start with um, Caleb Perry. I think that's an interesting one, Eric. It felt like Tennessee was in great shape. I think they're still in solid shape there. Seems like Kentucky is trying to make a bit of a push, if you will. I, I think Isaiah Horton's going to do something at the end of this month. And we just saw Addison Nichols with his final three, maybe August for, for Nichols, early September uh, for Nichols in a commitment. But otherwise, I don't know that a whole lot more guys are ready to jump in the boat or are even going to make a, a commitment out there that Tennessee's involved with, are there? Yeah, uh, I think it's limited right now. I do think Horton will make a decision here in the coming uh, little bit. I think, as you pointed out, Nichols, uh, maybe uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, Kayla Perry uh, likely is going to make a decision public at in this month um or speaking with him i think this is a kentucky is making a run i think this is a, ten, a tennessee cincinnati and i think purdue is is heavily involved in there as well i could see perry making a decision at the end of this month um you know caden pope's a guy that you know we've talked about but i think he might he's kind of hinted that he might want to take some more visits in football season so uh, i think the main ones are kind of the ones that are mentioned right here perry horton nichols is the ones that could uh, jump in the boat there before that September the 2nd date. Yeah, and I think for as for Cody Jones, I, I think that's a matter of where Tennessee – what does Tennessee feel like him? Do they need to see him some more? Cody did not have the greatest summer in terms of running for time and, and that type of thing. So, um, you know, how much does Tennessee pursue him from, from Michigan for a flip? I, I don't know. We'll have to, to wait and see kind of where Tennessee's at with him a, a little bit moving forward. So – um, I, I think how interested Cody J Tennessee ultimately ends up being in Cody Jones is a little bit back and forth. There's been some moments where you thought Tennessee was really going to push there, some other moments where you didn't think they were going to push, but they have continued to stay in some conversations with him. And, and I think those conversations will continue uh, throughout the early portion of, of fall uh, as he gets rolling into his senior year. Uh, Rob, any word on when the conference basketball schedule is going to be announced? And when will the 2022 football schedule be announced? I, I think the 22, 2022 football schedule is probably going to be um, announced probably like in October, maybe something like that, late September, early October. I don't have any idea on the basketball schedule from a conference standpoint. When's usually, that roll out? Usually August. Okay. In August, we'll probably see Sometime that. Sometime in August. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. On to the next one. Does the Supreme Court's ruling of 9 and 0 against the NCAA affect Tennessee's case at all? in terms of the investigation. Here's my opinion, and I want you guys to jump in there. I don't know that it affects it from what the NCAA will suggest. I do wonder if it affects what Tennessee ultimately self-imposes. And I think that's, a, that's something that Tennessee is, is continuing to look into and, and continuing to, to debate about um, as they continue on in their investigation here because of the NCAA's perceived loss of teeth. And, and look, let's face it, you know, with name, image, likeness, and the fact that they couldn't put any standard rules in place, uh, that, you know, they, they don't have the strength that they have. So does that alter how aggressive Tennessee is or isn't with their self-imposed penalties? That's my biggest question with that. 
I mean, it's a weird thing because I mean they they have kind of been defanged, but still the governing body of which Tennessee is a part of in terms of college athletics. So, I mean, it's very it's really problematic, and it's easy to poke holes in it. But I mean, you, you're still operating. You know, if, if you're Tennessee or any other program, you're, you're operating under their authority and you know and their rules, so to speak. Even you, and you know, it's always been separate. I mean, it's never been like civil or, or criminal cases with the NCAA. I mean, it's it's always been different. Yeah, and again, I, I think kind of what we spoke on last week as well. A lot of this is kind of unrelated. A lot of this is two separate things. I mean, you've got some severe um, and and some some deadly recruiting violations that were a major reason why Jeremy Pruitt, two of his assistants, and eight or nine staffers were let go, and and kind of what unfolded all this stuff. Sure, there's some more stuff to it, but uh, the bulk of it is that. And so, you know, now that this is going on, and the 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 NCAA is still put in kind of a, a vulnerable position that it is right now. I, the more I think about it, the more we talk about, it, I still think that. It, it, it for the most part it's kind of unrelated it's two separate things for for the most part that's kind of how i view it and of course i could be wrong but um we'll have to see certainly everybody's taking their time and trying to do decipher the best way to go about it and that, that's smart on tennessee's part yeah but i do think that tennessee's got to get to a resolution sooner rather than later and i think you'll look at that resolution and i think all of us would agree that that sooner rather than later is the best thing and, yeah. and i think you'll see something I'm, i'll be surprised if you don't see some kind of self-imposed deal done by the first part of September, uh, early September. I could be wrong, but it would not, I, I would be surprised if there's not some kind of movement in that direction, the early part of September. All right. Besides Cade Mays, who on this roster could you see developing into a day one or day two NFL draft pick? All right. That's not just for seniors. That that's, I, I take that to mean anybody on this, on this roster, young player, you know, who's a sophomore or anything like that. Who do you look at on this roster and think they could really develop into something, per, you know, pretty significant um, in, in terms of Jalen, Jalen Heights, the first Jalen Heights, the first guy that springs to my mind. And I don't know as a first round pick, but certainly, you know, day, I guess day two cops is the second to third round. I can certainly see him being somebody that goes in the top three rounds. Yeah, uh, you know, very much the, the, the emphasis on the second and third round as well. Jalen Hyatt, first one that came to mind. I think Tyler Barron is a guy that if he can continue to develop, uh, he can add a little bit more speed and, and show his versatility of playing a five, standing up, stacking up in the box. He's a guy that comes to mind. Um, you know, uh, of course, you know, Cade Mays was mentioned there. Uh, may, maybe you see what, you know, if, if a guy like, and again, he, he's been here a while and he, he's worked, he's been a while, but if he, if he can play and stay healthy, I mean, you know, Jeremy Pruitt used to rave about what Jerome Carvin was, his versatility in the interior, but we got to see it because we haven't seen it on a consistent level so far. So, you know, that's a guy that comes to mind. And then of course, um, you know, Brandon Turnage has not played hardly at all. You got to see him do something, but of course he's got the skill set that you like. If he comes in here and plays a couple of good years, maybe, maybe that's a guy uh, right now, but right now I think, I think that conversation is very, uh, very limited in terms of uh, day one and day two. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, mean, go ahead. I was going to say Darnell Wright has the measurables. He doesn't have the yeah. film. Right. You know, for sure. Yeah, and we'll see what the, the culture change or the you know the coaching change means for some of those guys. I'd be curious to see what kind of development there is in the defensive backfield too with Willie Martinez. Does a guy like Warren Burrell um, t- take off and ha- have a big year? Um, we know Willie Martinez had three players from Central Florida drafted. Now they weren't all drafted in the first two days. I'm not saying that, but but he did have three players drafted out of that secondary at, at Central Florida, and obviously he's got a resume of being able to develop guys in the back end of a defense. So I'd be curious to see how that position develops, not just this year, but in year two and three under Willie Martinez as well. Um, how does Horton Miller and White compare to the current wide receiver skill sets? It's been mentioned that Hypo wants more speed. Well, I think when you're talking about speed, Eric, that's the first thing that, that White, that, that, that when you talk about White, that's what you're talking about is speed. And, and he's different than, than Horton or Miller, who are both bigger guys with wide, it's all about speed. Yeah, all about speed. Very uh, complimentary with, of course, Jalen Hyatt. And you've got, you know, Bayless is there right now. Um, Anderson Kobe's a fast guy. Uh, Walker Merrill is a fast guy. And so, you know, speed, he's another one of those speed demons. Might be, you know, the fastest guy of, of that bunch. And so 
Uh, that's pretty good. Of course, you got Miller and Horton who are different. Miller can do a little bit of everything. As can Horton, they're bigger guys and they're you know complementary to the guys who can go up and get it, line up on the outside, can play a little bit in the slot. But in terms of wanting speed, White certainly leads that conversation and fits well with you know Tennessee's top two receivers this year and Bayless and and Jalen Hyatt. And of course, the Jimmys as well. Callaway, he he can fly. He you saw that a couple of times this spring and and when healthy, Holiday as well. Uh, could factor into the return game. So Tennessee's got a couple of speedsters, and, and White certainly is is in that group. Yeah, and Horton's a guy that is just a big-time competitor, too. Anybody that's played against him or watched him play will talk about his competitiveness. I'm not going to say he's Jawan Jennings or anything like that, but but he is a guy who has drawn some comparisons because of his competitive nature uh, and kind of his mentality a little bit um, to, to what we saw a little bit with Jawan Jennings when, when he was in high school as well. So – We'll see what uh, those two guys look like. I, I'm fascinated to see Cam Miller um, when he's in a weight program consistently. I, I mentioned this in the podcast on Tuesday. I, I'm very, um, very interested to see his development once he gets into football year round with with all the facilities and nutrition and everything that, that you need. His, his high school just does not have uh, some of the things that you see from a lot of the high schools and, and other parts of even the city of Memphis, but certainly in Nashville, certainly in other states, uh, they're just very limited from a facility standpoint. So I want to see how his development is at, at this level. All right, Rob, bigger cluster, the coaching search that netted Jeremy Pruitt and Philip Fulmer or the investigation that unnetted Jeremy Pruitt and Philip Fulmer. Well, I mean, I think it's, unless I misunderstand the question, I think it's easily the coaching search. I mean, you, you, you had an athletic director get fired for bungling, you know, the, the, the search or for, you know, administrative infighting at a, you know, at a level that was just soap opera esque. I mean, the investigation, I mean, that's been, I don't know, unless they mean, you know, kind of the odd way that it, it allegedly started. I mean, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's been pretty thorough and professional. I mean, I understand why fan, fans are going nuts because it's taken so long, but I think that's because it's been meticulous, not because it's been just the chaotic incompetence and, and backstabbing and everything we saw from, you know, after, after Butch was fired. You yeah, guys I mean, were much, I was going to say, you guys were much closer to it at that time. I mean, I was, I was in Knoxville for like two months when that happened and I was fresh on the job, but I will never forget that coaching search of 2017. I, I, without a doubt, easily the bigger cluster, hands down, because how many guys were in serious talks to take the job ended up getting a raise? How many times did Tennessee get turned down? Tennessee had a guy, turned out, didn't have a guy. It was it was a big mess, that's that's for sure. Tennessee, I mean, the athletic director flies to California without any of his bosses he's MIA, knowing yeah. or having given their blessing. You know, he's out of, in, in, in 20 – the year 2018, he's unreachable for, you know, hours and hours, which is, you know, impossible in, with technology. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's not even a debate. Uh, it's a, I mean, just because of, um, again, I mean, the day-to-day the, the -day scrutiny, the day-to-day -day kind of laughing that everybody had around what Tennessee was. I mean, they didn't put the Gruden thing to bed for the longest time. Um you know, ju just everything that was involved in that coaching search was. Well, and the power, you know, the, 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 the scheming power plays behind closed doors at the, at the super booster level, which, you know, still, you know, you can't write about or talk about because it's all second or third hand, but you hear it so much, you know, that some of it's got to be true. I mean, they, you know, they at, did the, at the board of trustee level. Yeah. I mean, think about this. They did a, a nearly thousand page document dump. On the, on the ouster of John Curry as a result of the coaching search. That was the ouster there. So, uh, I mean, I get it. A lot of people were – and I don't think Dante Plowman was very smart in talking about the severity of the, of the infractions that Jeremy Pruitt had and, and kind of the, the details that she spoke of when the investigation was really just getting going or was just about a month, a month and a half old and, and what's now turned out to be a – seven or eight month investigation i get that that part that press conference was odd but nobody is writing you know four thousand words on the on the coaching search based on a document dump the, the way we did after after john curry's dismissal so uh, i don't think there's to me there's not much debate with that one um all right any committed recruits tennessee is talking to or might try to re get back in with 
Um, Eric, depending on where Branson Robinson goes, if he goes to Georgia, that does Tennessee make a run there with 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 with, um, um, with, uh, with Jordan Jordan, Jordan James? With Jordan yeah. James, yeah. Sorry, name escaped me there. With Jordan James, that He's... that would make some sense, right? Yeah, it would make a whole lot of sense. Of course, an in-state prospect and um, a guy that's talked to these coaching this coaching staff that he committed. Uh, it wasn't very. It wasn't right after the coaching staff got here, but it was still relatively soon. But there were conversations there. I think Tennessee would absolutely. Um, either way, e- even if, and I think Austin pointed this out, and maybe the war room or something. Um, even if you know Robinson doesn't elect to go to Georgia, I think Tennessee might even take another run at, at Jordan Bryant James anyway. So that would make a whole lot of sense. Again, we mentioned earlier. Um, the conversations uh, are, are still ongoing with Cody Jones, um, you know, the the, uh, uh, the Memphis commit, and he's he took a couple of visits. He's been posting offers that he got this summer. Um, I think Tennessee is is still uh, talking and seeing where they can get there, but those are two that kind of jump out immediately when I read this question. Well, and, and I'll be honest with you, that, that may change depending on what kind of success Tennessee can have. If Tennessee has any oh, yeah. early success, then suddenly um, maybe some committed players are listening more or answer the phone that might not be answering right now. But to do that, Tennessee's got to have success early this season uh, on the field. All right, next two questions. If Tennessee settles with Pruitt, will the actual infractions that occur be made public due to it being turned into the NCAA? I know this is speculation, but if you're going to settle with Pruitt, why would you publicly state the severity of the infractions that occurred in that January press conference? I'll say number two, I don't think at the point of that press conference, the chancellor had any thoughts of settling anything with Jeremy Pruitt. I think she was very clear that she was not going to give any part of a $12 million check to Jeremy Pruitt. Now, do I think they ultimately end up settling? Yes. And I thought that would always be the case at at some point. But at that moment in time, I don't think she had any thoughts of of giving him any money. And I think that's why she spoke in detail about the severity of those things to further solidify the point that she was not going to write any kind of settlement check or any part of that $12 million check. I I think ultimately she will turn out, it'll be turned out that she was wrong. Um, But I think that's why she said it at at the time. As for number one, Rob, whether they settle with Pruitt or they don't settle with Pruitt, when Tennessee turns their stuff in to the NCAA, the NCAA will release their findings once they complete their investigation. Now there'll be a lot of names redacted out of that. Okay. So it won't have, every specific violation who's tied to over it won't have who's tied to every specific violation but it will have the violations in there we saw that with the bruce pearl barbecue uh when when the ncaa released that years ago when you see that everywhere i mean that'll be part of a a document release the same way it was with donnie tindall as well um that's just part of the ncaa so you will know what the infractions were you may not know who committed them because of redaction uh, or who they were committed with in terms of a recruit, but but you will know what those uh, infractions are uh, whenever this thing is completely um, finished out. When, whenever that case may be, that's just that's the way it goes, right, Rob? Yeah, it will be. And like I said, I mean, just like you said, I mean, there'll be a lot of redactions, and you, you may not be able to piece together exactly what happened, but you will know what infractions occurred, and you know because they're going to justify whatever penalties they um. In, in those can Tennessee get away with do without doing a bowl ban and just 10 scholarship reductions do you, do you guys think that that Tennessee can get away with that or do you think that a, a bowl ban is is inevitable for this thing at this point I think a, a personal opinion I think a bowl ban is inevitable and I mean not that that's what in my opinion you would lead off with I mean you, you don't I mean scholarships you, you never want to give up scholarships and so like I think we've all been kind of in unison saying it's likely going to be both, but I think uh, the bowl ban without a doubt would be kind of the first thing. Rob? Uh, man, it's so hard for me to predict with the NCAA because they're so all, they're so all over the board. I mean, at, know, the, I mean I have, at this point, everybody who's on the roster might be out of eligibility before the tennis, before the NCAA makes a ruling. If you, if you look at previous NCAA cases with other, yeah, other schools. It, I mean, in the way they haven't investigated any, in this, any of the basketball coaches, I just I – mean, I, I can't predict what the NCAA it is. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I don't believe it's inevitable that a bowl ban just because they're so inconsistent. But then again, there's never been a chance where they stood out there and said, 
we did this, we did this, we did this as well. So it's dozens of it's kind of kind of weird violations. Yes, no, no question about yeah. that. <laughs> um, since Tennessee included the NCAA from the start of the investigation, fired all the previous coaches, fired the entire recruiting staff, and have already suffered severe harm and loss of players to the transfer portal and recruiting for 2021 in the next several years. Why self-impose any additional punishment at all? If you don't impose some punishment, then the NCAA is coming to town to handle their punishment part of it. I mean, that's the way it goes. Now, you can debate what that punishment should be. Should it be a bowl ban or should you try to not have the bowl ban? Um, a loss of 10 scholarships on the 85 would, would probably not be that, that significant given where Tennessee's numbers are. Um, would you – self-imposed Rob some uh, you know official visits losing some of those losing some evaluation period you know in terms of when coaches can be on the road um, that's always a possibility out there as well but you can't just sit here and go hey okay we did all this wrong and boy we've suffered greatly because of it because there's a cloud around us but we're not going to punish ourselves that's that's not how it works I mean yeah you gotta you gotta self-impose something just to get the the bargaining session going in my opinion yeah. I mean, just to kind of establish a baseline for, you know, to get the conversation started with the NCAA. Yeah. I, I mean, look, you, you cannot just sit here and say, hey, Eric, Eric, you can't go. We've got nearly 50 violations and we're not going to do anything about it because we've suffered. <laughs> we've we've suffered <laughs> greatly because of the nine month investigation we've been we've been putting ourselves through. So we're just not going to punish ourselves for that. It just doesn't work that way. Um, no, it doesn't. You, you, you've got to get out there and you got to you got to try to throw the first punch quote unquote and what will be this little boxing match and uh, negotiation to try to figure it out but but again to, to this question's point and I made this point as well I mean Tennessee obviously obviously has been proactive um, and so it's it, Tennessee to this point has done everything it can to try to limit the blow that will be coming but you still got to get out there and try to self-impose something first or you will get hammered well and here's the here's the thing I mean will the NCAA take that into consideration and go light on Tennessee because Tennessee has been so open and clear with the NCAA when some other schools have basically said, we dare you to come after us. Okay. We we've seen what's happened at, at Kansas and at Louisville and basketball, North Carolina with an academic scandal. We we've seen all those things. And so we're not really worried about it. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, you do whatever you want to do. And, and so far the NCAA hasn't punished, punished any of those guys, particularly in basketball, Rob. I mean, you're sitting here with LSU. I mean, they've been through, I mean, they, they've been in the national spotlight for how many years now in basketball and they're continuing to recruit at a high level, play in the NCAA tournament and have their same coaching staff. Yeah. I mean, Kansas is, I mean, Bill Self's got a lifetime contract, right? Yeah. I mean, so to me, but that's why I, I can't, come close to predicting because I, mean, I, thought, I thought the basketball stuff was pretty cut and dry I and mean, you got people on tape i mean actually on tape and it's and, and like we just talked about previously it's not like the ncaa has the same burden of proof that the government does when they go into a courthouse i mean they don't have to prove that will wade actually you know came through with his strong ass offer they just the fact that it's on tape should, should be enough I mean, they don't have to prove that sean miller actually you know delivered cash to kids himself I mean, the fact that it's on tape should be enough to, for a case so i'm I, i'm not a big fan of the NCAA. they're just so inconsistent and um it's it's an imperfect system to put it put it mildly yeah definitely all right to hoops we go rob you mentioned after deontay green's official visit that he might not be a take but said in the most recent chat the staff wouldn't bring him in on an official visit if he wasn't a take can you clarify though where he is in terms of on Tennessee's board and is he a take is he not a take also Noah Clowney continues to mention Tennessee is recruiting him hard wanting to visit here is there something going on with Clowney uh Green's a take and you know the clarification is that he that was like 40 days ago when I wrote the original comment and things have changed um Noah Clowney is something going on I mean Tennessee's talking to him and recruited him I mean if you mean there's something like going on like he's an impending commitment or something no i mean i think they'll try to get him on campus he's he's on the board all right um curious before we start the season now that you've covered three unsuccessful coaches here was there a specific event where you thought Dooley butch or pruitt wasn't going to make it or was it more of a body of work conclusion 
Bonus question. When should we expect to see the pre-written story about the team working harder than any other time in the off season and how great our new strength staff is? Wink, wink. Um, let's, let's go to the question of, of merit. Obviously he was in the bonus question. He was talking about what we always talk about, how everybody's going to get to SEC media days and they're going to talk about how they've never worked harder, which you will hear from every, all 14 coaches, um, next week in Birmingham, everybody's had the greatest off season. Nobody's worked there. No, the, no team has ever worked harder than their team has. And players will say that alike. Um, R- Rob, I'll start with you because you covered all three of these. Was there a moment for you where you said, boy, Derek Dooley's not going to make it here. Was there a moment for you with Butch or Jeremy Pruitt, or was that just kind of one of those deals where you thought, eh, you know, it, it, it just over time, it felt like it wasn't going to happen. Uh, with, I mean, it was not a specific event with Dooley that that last year with that staff that he had to cobble together that, you know, they pulled John Palermo out of a cabin at, at the lake, uh, you know, the, the South and Siri hire. I mean, it, it was apparent before very deep into that season that that was just an unmitigated disaster. So I would say, again, not one game or, or anything like that, but it, it became apparent pretty quickly with that last staff, I think to me and to you and a lot of people that it wasn't going to happen. Um, losing to Georgia state through it. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that I didn't think that it was going to be impossible to cover by recover from, but to, to me, that was a real eye opener. I mean, I was just like, wow, this, that, that was bad. And again, I'm not saying that I knew then that he wasn't going to make it, but I knew then that he had a lot of growth to make as a, as a football coach, a head football coach. And with Butch, just that that collapse after, you know, the whole controversy with Jalen Hurd, um, after the, that Georgia game, beating Florida and Georgia, and then blowing the SEC East by losing to South Carolina and uh, Vandy coming down the stretch. At that point, I, I mean, I, didn't, I don't know that I'm saying he, he was not – he was going to get fired the next year, but I, I had a pretty strong opinion that he was a, a – very average football coach after that. And he was losing, you know, Kamara, Barnett, Dobbs off that team and, and choked coming down the stretch when Atlanta was just laying there on a platter. I can uh, I can really only speak for Jeremy. I was here for Butch's last season. He didn't even coach that whole season. But uh, for Pruitt's, and, and again, like Rob said, these weren't, oh, he's definitely not going to make it. For me, it was just alarms, alarms going off, you know, red flags. Uh, you beat Auburn, you know, on the planes. Great, you know, a uh, 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 ranked team, a really good win. Yeah, or you beat Kentucky later on that season, and then the way you end that year, you give up a fifty burger to what Missouri and to Vanderbilt. It looked like that team just kind of quit playing towards the end of the season, and that's that's not what you want to see. One of those was at home as well. Um, the next season, obviously Georgia State's, and then in this last season, which so many things went wrong. Um, I mean, the closing the gap comment, you, you just you can't say that because your track record so far, um, you know, had, you know, 12, 13, 21 point plus losses in your tenure. I mean, that, that's what Jeremy Pruitt outside of how it ended for me. That's how he's going to be remembered. Just all the blowout losses that was here. And when he made that comment about closing the gap, that was, that, that was alarms going all over my head right there. And for many others, you just, you, you can't say that. Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing with Pruitt. If there's not an NCAA investigation, is, is he getting ready to coach another year here? The, I believe so. That COVID give him a pass. So I believe you know, so. Yeah. I mean, the, the 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 straw on Jeremy Pruitt was in terms of when did you know it was, you know, was basically when, when you learned the significance of, of the investigation. Um, you know, now I'm not saying he would have been successful here, but he would still be here at this point. Now there would be a lot of gnashing of the teeth, and there would not be a whole lot of excitement going on. But but he would. See, would be hot. Yeah, yeah, he, he would still be here. Um, I'm with you, Rob, at the month of November and Butch's next to last year, um, when he made the comment after they went down, you know, they, they entering that month when he made the comment about how the closing month was going to be harder than, than the first part of the year or the middle part of that month where they beat Florida at home, went to Georgia and went on a Hail Mary, went and played top five undefeated Texas A&M and then played Alabama, I think, the next week. And he was suggesting that, you know, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, Missouri, and a non-conference team was going to be a harder stretch of games for his team. That that was a that was a red flag comment. Obviously, his team did not perform down the stretch there at all. And then I, I agree with you on on sincerity. I mean, you had the offense 
to, to put up all kinds of numbers and you couldn't get anything done because um, you just had, you were just bad. I mean, you're just so bad on defense. All right. A couple more, then we're going to get out the, out the door here. Um, let me see this one here. Um, in your opinion, why was Jim Chain's offense such a failure at Tennessee? Was it really as simple as JG being bad? Was Pruitt meddling with the offense too much? Was Chaney's offense assistants not doing their job at the high level? Um, bonus question, who the heck is uh, Grant Ferrick and why isn't a 6'5", 216-pound wide receiver seeking a field? How bad can you be at 6'5", 216 pounds? Um, the Jim Chaney's all about quarterback. I mean, it, it, he, he, couldn't get, he couldn't get successful quarterback play. Did Jeremy Pruitt, Pruitt meddle in that offense? Yeah, I'm sure he did to some degree. But, but I think ultimately it was about quarterback play. Um, they just weren't good enough at, at the quarterback position, um, not even close uh, to, to being good enough at the quarterback position for Jim Cheney's offense to be successful, which is really surprising, Rob, because you thought that's the one thing he could finish or he could fix what was quarterbacks because he had, he had done that everywhere, but he could not do it at Tennessee. Just couldn't. I mean, I think in the end, I mean, I mean, he's not as big of a bust as, you know, some of them, but you know, like Chris Donald level, you know, some of some of those, but Jared it ended up being one of the most overrated recruits in the, in the past couple of decades. I mean, you know, Tennessee's had some pretty big five-star bust and Jared was almost a five-star, but I mean, I don't, I don't blame Janie for the level of quarterback play. I mean, I think he was dealt a bum hand. I mean, the kid just didn't have it. Yep. I mean, it's just, it just didn't, it didn't work. And, and that's, that's the bottom line. Again, I think Jeremy Pruitt did medal some, but I, I think um, the biggest reason that offense wasn't successful is because of quarterback play. And the reason I say that Eric is because it had been successful everywhere it's ever been, um, including a Georgia, yeah, I mean, it, the, the two previous years. It's not like he was trying to adjust to this level of ball or anything like that. I mean, it's not like a, a Dave Clawson coming in and bringing something brand new into the league for the first time. I mean, it, I mean, it had been proven at the power five level for a long, long time. Yeah. His resume speaks for itself. I mean, he's done it all over the place. He's done it for so very long. And uh, to your point, I just think it's quarterback. You couldn't fix quarterback. You couldn't uh, change the way Garantano looked at the defense, uh, collaborated, whatever the case may be, you know, went from play to play game to game. Whatever the case was, you couldn't fix that position. I do think Jeremy Pruitt uh, meddled a lot. What did he call plays? Absolutely not. But uh, I think it might be a combination of all of the above. But what it comes down to, you didn't have a quarterback run this offense, and this offense went nowhere in three years because, uh, again, you had no quarterback. All right. Uh, you all said a couple of weeks ago, reporting on recruiting is all about developing relationships. I'm interested in how that process occurs. When does it start? How do you go about getting numbers, contact info? Is there a database? Yes, that's where most of the numbers come from. Uh, does it start with a kid and family? How does this compare today versus the late 90s, early 2000s when there wasn't social media? Um, it's vastly different compared. I mean, I, I'll tell a quick story. I know we're about out of time here. But, I mean, I, I remember in the 90s sending out hundreds, nearly thousands of letters to high schools um, addressed to a kid to try it with a questionnaire to try to get the kid to send the questionnaire back so you could get his phone number because there wasn't camps to go to where guys filled out information. Uh, there wasn't kids filling out, you know, information cards to get their name in a database or anything like that. Uh, so you totally did it differently. Um, it's still about relationships. I mean, you go try to meet with them face to face. You know, the more FaceTime you get with a kid, the, the more that kid's most likely to answer the telephone. You know, I mean, Rob, think about the number of kids you've seen at basketball camps from the time they're in the eighth or ninth grade. And then you go to start talking to them when they're juniors in, in, in high school, thinking about a decision. They have an idea who you are because you've seen them. You've, you've interviewed them face to face. And I think that's a big part of building relationships. Yeah, I agree. I mean, think about a million years ago when me and you and Jonathan Crawford and his parents went to the Copper Cellar and ate lunch one Saturday afternoon. I mean, it's you, there's no, there's no substitute for getting to know the people and their, and their families. Yeah. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Social media has made it easier and in some ways to get a hold of kids because you can direct message kids, but, but it's also means Eric, that kids can handle their own recruitment. Um, you know, you, you follow it different. I mean, it, it was 
figuring out where a guy was going to visit was a story several years ago. Now they just mm -hmm. tell you where they're visiting. You know, they just list their, they, they run down their, their travel plans for the month on social media now. So that part of it's different. Yeah. I mean, social media has obviously changed the game. You have edits. I mean, edits are a huge thing. They post out graphics, their top 12, their offers, their visits, their summer plans, all that type of stuff. Um, by the way, I do want to say I'm glad I didn't work for you in the late 90s because that sounds awful, sending all those letters <laughs> out. But uh, Parties, man. Ordered a <laughs> lot of pizzas and had stuff in parties. Oh, man, that, that's awful. I know that would be my job if, if we were still doing that. Um, but, yeah, the relationships. And, and, again, I've been with you guys for, you know, almost two years now. And, I mean, it took a while for me to – I mean, it really took a while for me kind of to get in this zone. I'm still learning every single day, but, you know, calling a kid, introducing yourself, jumping on the Zoom, seeing them out at camps this summer. This is the first time I've actually got to do that since I've worked with you guys, and that helps out an awful lot. But, you know, getting in early and uh, just just keeping connected is is how uh, I'm able to talk to some of these kids now when they're making their commits. And, I mean, you know, they remember me. They'll pick up the phone. They'll text me back. Sometimes they don't. But um, uh, that that's kind of the success that i found. And, of course, a lot of that starts now on social media. Yeah, no doubt when you start to get to know somebody – um, it's a little different from back. I mean, used to, you didn't call a recruit until late October, first of November. That was when you made your first recruiting call. You, you would not from, from signing day in February to October, you didn't call recruits. Um, it just didn't happen. I remember, I mean, when I started, when I started with, with started VolQuest in 2000, we didn't do spring recruiting stories. I mean, that, that really was not a thing at that point. It, it, it really, because of the internet, evolved into year-round coverage because that was just not the case for, for so long. You just covered it in a small window. You didn't have juniors making unofficial visits in the spring. That's or exactly right. official yeah. visits. No, nobody was out. Nobody was out seeing it. Right. Nobody was out seeing anything. There might some guys come to the spring game. Maybe. Maybe. I can remember you remember this. I think the first time I even remember a camp offered a commitment was Ryan Carr. I don't think I don't think we even knew who he was. That's right. That's right. And, and I mean, he got he, was, that's he, the first he, time we had to do a story about a kid getting an offer in camp and, and committing. And, yep. and I, I, I'm I'm a, I'm 99 percent sure we'd never heard his name before. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely we hadn't. And so it, you know it's grown and changed a lot because of the day to day, hour by hour coverage that it gives. But it ultimately gets back to being able to cover it. But it's because of relationships. All right, that's going to put the bow tie on this edition of the Mailbag Podcast presented by Blue Water Climate Control. For Eric Kane and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody.